Hello Planeswalkers, Tyler here, and in honor of this scary month of October, I'm bringing you a terrifying deck tech. On today's chopping block, we have the King Turn Dragon, Corvold. A 4-4 flying dragon noble for two black red green, the fake cursed king demands that you sacrifice a permanent when he both enters the battlefield and attacks. Whenever you sacrifice a permanent, you get to draw a card and Corvold gets a plus one plus one counter. Corvold operates under a very simple strategy. Consume your board, get big, and swing in for massive damage. As such, this deck is fairly straightforward. Our four biggest categories are going to consist of 1. Things that like to die. 2. Things that pay us off for things dying. 3. Things that supply us tokens without needing to die. And 4. Things that can sacrifice at instant speed. Without further ado, let's get things started with our first category. As stated above, our first category revolves around things that either like to die or that can sacrifice themselves for free. See, the way Corvold is worded makes it so the sacrifice of any permanent, be it creature, artifact, enchantment, or land, triggers his card drawing counter, and it doesn't even need to be sacrificed to him personally to go off. Bloodsoaked Champion is a 2-1 for a single black that can't block. He also has Raid, so if you've attacked with a creature this turn, you can pay one in a black to return him from the graveyard to the battlefield for multiple uses. Soccer a Tribe Elder can sacrifice itself to snag us a land, as can Burnished Heart, though the heart requires a small mana investment, but makes up for it by grabbing two lands instead. Sprouting Thrynax is a 3-3 Lizard that spits out three Sapperlings when it dies, not only replacing itself, but giving us more bodies to either feed to Corvold or throw in our multitude of wood chippers. Squee the Immortal can be cast from the grave or from exile, so no matter how many times Corvold eats him, we can always bring him back. I try not to think too hard of how he's coming back from Corvold eating him, but that is beside the point. Rooting Kavu exiles itself on death to shuffle all creature cards from our grave back into our deck to use and abuse them again. Dariga is reincarnated also exiles himself on death, but returns in a few turns once he's out of egg counters. Mishra's Bobble is a zero mana artifact that can sacrifice itself to give us a peek at the top card of any player's library, and then draw us a card on a slight delay. This can either give us vital information on any of our opponent's decks, or just kind of a DIY scry without the ability to bottom the card. It also gets us two cards if Corvold is out, so hey, zero mana for two cards, probably better than one mana for three, so suck it Ancestral Recall. Icker Wellspring draws us a card when it enters the battlefield and when it exits, so it serves as free fodder for Corvold, while Spine of Ishsa, though expensive at 7 mana, can blow up any permanent and return to our hand when it hits the grave, giving us even more value for our fake cursed king. Finally, Seal of Doom is an enchantment that we can play for 2 and a black, then sacrifice for free to blow up a non-black creature. Is there a flyer in the way stopping our commander from connecting? Play the seal, blow up the blocker, draw a card, and watch Corvold grow. Our second and arguably much more fun category is our payoffs for when things die. Sure, Corvold's trigger is nice, but sometimes we need a little bit more, and we can't always count on him being around to capitalize on our sacrifices. While some of these cards bleed into our sacrifice outlet category, their first job is to help us when things die. Blood Artist lets us drain any player for one when it or any other creature dies. Zulaport Cutthroat makes every opponent lose a life and gives us a life when any of our creatures die. Anax, Harden in the Forge, can replace our non-token creatures with token satyrs whenever they die, sometimes even giving us two tokens if the creature that died had at least four power. And Grismold is a trampler that gives everyone tokens but can also grow bigger when those tokens die. Judith the Scourge Diva grants our board a nice plus one plus oh while also pinging any target when a non-token creature we control dies. Mayhem Devil pings any target when anyone sacrifices a permanent, and Erebos lets us pay two life to draw a card when one of our creatures dies. Falconrath Noble shares the same effect as Blood Artist, draining any player for one when it or something else dies. Poison Tip Archer makes every opponent lose one life when a creature besides itself dies, and Sifter of Skulls lets us double dip by giving us a 1-1 Eldrazi Scion whenever a non-token creature we control is die. Which can in turn be either sacrificed for colorless mana or further fed to our sacrifice outlets. 
Sir Conrad deals a damage to every opponent when a creature either enters or leaves the graveyard, and Butcher of Malakir forces our opponents to sacrifice creatures whenever a creature dies, and Bastion of Remembrance acts as an enchantment version of both our Blood Artist and our Noble, though it comes with a 1-1 token on entry and makes every opponent lose a life, rather than just one. Death Reap Ritual lets us draw a card on our end step if a creature died this turn. Black Market accumulates counters as creatures die and pays us black mana for the amount of counters it has. Gutter Grime replaces our dying non-token creatures with ooze tokens that grow larger as things die. Boulder Vine Reclamation gives us life and lets us draw cards when our creatures die. And finally, Dragon Appeasement strips us of our draw step, but lets us draw a card whenever a creature we control becomes sacrificed. This last caveat is a good way to help us not deck ourselves while drawing cards off of things dying. Our third category may be smaller than the first two, but it is no less important. These cards focus primarily on supplying us with tokens that we can sacrifice to our various sacrifice outlets, or in one case, just to itself. Tilanali Summoner lets us pump mana into her to create 1-1 elementals. If we have the City's Blessing, which she can also grant us with her Ascend ability if we have 10 or more permanents in play, we get to keep the Elementals, otherwise we exile them at the next end step. The Exile Clause is a little annoying since that won't trigger our death-related abilities, but partner her with a free sack outlet or generate enough Elementals to grant the City's Blessing and we're cooking with gas. Krenko, Tin Street Kingpin, acts almost like a tiny Corvold, but in reverse. By attacking, he can give himself counters and generate goblin tokens. The longer we can protect him, the more goblin tokens we generate and the happier Corvold becomes. I do hear that Jun dragons really like goblins. Savvy Hunter generates food tokens whenever she attacks or blocks, which we can either pay two to sacrifice and gain three life, or sacrifice two tokens to the hunter to draw a card. Both Dragon Lair Spider and Izoni Thousand Eyed can generate 1 1 insect tokens for us. The spider makes them when our opponent casts a spell, and his only makes an amount on entry equal to the amount of creatures in our graveyard. She can also sacrifice creatures for black and green to gain us life and draw us cards. Brass's Bounty is a sorcery that gives us treasure tokens depending on the amount of lands we control. These are great in that they not only serve as a way to ramp us, but sacrificing them for mana also triggers Corvold, so we can generate mana, make Corvold bigger, and draw cards all at the same time. Finally, we have Terastodon, a 9-9 elephant that blows up three non-creature permanents when it enters the battlefield and replaces them with 3-3 elephant tokens. While, yes, we could use these to deal with problematic things our opponents have, we could also blow up our own stuff, thus triggering our own effects and giving us more creatures. Our last major group of playmakers are free sacrifice outlets. These include Bogarden Dragonheart, who can eat a creature to become a 4-4 flying dragon with haste, Scarland Thranax, who can eat a creature to gain a plus one plus one counter, Wostrider, who enters the battlefield with an 0-1 goat and has the ability to sacrifice things to let us scry, and can later escape from the graveyard if we want to use it again, and finally, the namesake of the aristocrat style deck, the Falconrath Aristocrat, a flying haste vampire that can sacrifice creatures to grant itself indestructible. If it eats humans, it also gains a plus one plus one counter, but we don't run very many of those, so it doesn't really matter. These are a collection of our more efficient sacrifice outlets, since as I stated above, they require no mana investment to sacrifice, and it can all be done at instant speed to make the most work out of our board if our stuff is in danger or we need Corvold to go in for the kill. Whew, that was all a mouthful. But, with our primary categories out of the way, let's take a look at what else the deck runs before we move on to our mana base. These cards all serve mostly just to help us stay safe with things like removal and ramp, so we can stay in the game and make sure Corvold is good to go in for the kill. The first two cards I wanted to bring up actually win us the game immediately if we partner them with any of our free sacrifice outlets, and that's Grumgully the Generous and Murderous Redcap. With an outlet, the two actually go infinite with each other, since the red cap deals damage equal to its power to any target on entry and has persist. So it returns to the battlefield with a minus one minus one counter when it dies. Grumgully makes it so that all of our non-humans enter the battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter. And since the red cap is a human and minus one minus one counters are canceled out by plus one plus one counters, we can sacrifice it repeatedly to shock all of our opponents to death. Chainer, Nightmare Adept, is a neat way to give a creature in our hand pseudo-haste if we need to. 
Otherwise, he serves as an easy way to recur creatures from our grave, like the Sprouting Thranax, who can in turn supply more bodies for our forces. Golgari Fine Broker is another, albeit slower way to recur any permanent back to our hand. Storev, Devkar, and Lich is the third method of recursion, only needing to connect with an enemy in order to return any of our creatures or planeswalkers back to the hand, provided they didn't die this turn. God Eternal Ronis is an amazing game ender. If we can get Corvold up to a high enough number, about 11 power, God Eternal Ronis' ability to double his power and give him vigilance can spell certain doom for any opponent. Should he die or we sacrifice him, he also puts himself back in the deck to use again and again. With all these cards that we're drawing, Psychosis Crawler can serve as another massive threat on the field as well as a consistent source of chip damage. The Victus Esmati, the Dyer, is a personal stayover of mine from the deck's early days. I just love his ability to get around things like indestructibility, and since most of our deck consists of permanents, there is very little chance of us whiffing after we sacrifice to his effect. Arlen Cord and Domery Chaosbringer are our deck's only two planeswalkers. Arlen can give us tokens while also pumping members of our team, while Domery helps us ramp as well as helps us dig for more creatures. Undying Evil and Kaya's Ghost Form are both cheap and easy ways to squeeze multiple uses out of our creatures, while Putrefy and Death Sprout can deal with threats that Corvold just can't get over. Treasured Find offers a cheap recursion of anything from our grave, as does Fungal Rebirth, though the Rebirth can only grab permanents. That being said, if something died this turn, Fungal Rebirth also gives us two 1 1 Sapperlings. Harrow, Soul Ring, and Arcane Signet all help us ramp, with Harrow pulling double duty as another sacrifice trigger for Corvold. And while it doesn't ramp us, our Millery Sphere can help fix our mana and make sure we don't miss our land drops, all while also offering sacrifice triggers to Corvold. Finally, Rhythm of the Wild can help make sure our creatures hit the battlefield, then either grow them or make them hasty, depending on what we need at the time. I also pack a set of Lightning Greaves to keep our Dragon King safe. And those are all of our non-land cards in the deck. Let's take a look real quick at the mana base. Rugged Highlands, Jungle Hollow, and Bloodfell Caves all enter tapped, give us a life on ETB, and each tap for two of our colors. Timber Gorge enters tapped and can tap for either a red or a green. Temples of Malady and Abandon each enter tap, let us scry one on ETB, and tap for two of our colors. Stomping Grounds can tap for either a red or a green, and can enter the battlefield untapped if we pay two life. And Arachnos Carnarium enters tapped while also bouncing a land back to our hand, but also taps for both a black and a red at the same time. Myriad Landscape, Jund Panorama, Evolving Wilds, and Terramorphic Expanse can all help us fix our mana, or even ramp us in the case of the landscape, while also triggering its Corvold Sacrifice effect. Reliquary Tower is a great way to hold on to all those cards that we're drawing. Memorial to Glory can tap for a green or sacrifice itself to let us look five deep in our deck for a creature, and High Market can either tap for a colorless or tap to let us sacrifice a creature to gain one life. The life gain is nice, but having a sacrifice outlet on a land is way nicer. Grim Backwoods can also tap for a colorless, or we can pay two black grain into it, tap it, and sacrifice a creature to draw a card. Gingerbread Cabin is a non-basic forest that enters untapped if we control at least three other forests, and gives us a food token whenever it enters untapped. Dwarven Mine is from the same cycle, entering tapped unless we control three or more mountains, and giving us a 1-1 dwarf token if it enters untapped. Drownyard Temple taps for a colorless, or we can pay three to return it from our graveyard to the battlefield tap, basically giving us a land version of Squee the Immortal. Gargoyle Castle can tap for a colorless, or we can pay five to tap and sacrifice it to get a 3-4 gargoyle creature token with flying potentially triggering Corvold twice. Game Trail enters tapped unless we reveal a mountain or forest from our hand and taps for either a red or a green. Field of Ruin can sacrifice itself to blow up problematic non-basics. Cryptic Caves can sacrifice itself to draw a card if we have five or more lands. And finally, Trusty Old Command Tower can tap for any of our colors. Top things off with four basic forests, five basic mountains, and four basic swamps, and we are ready to go. I hope you like this deck tech on Corvold, Fae Cursed King. It's loads of fun to play, and once you get the gears turning, it's hard to stop. Let me know what you thought about the deck in the comment section below, and be sure to check the description of this video for the complete deck list on MTG Goldfish. Be sure to shoot us a like, maybe throw us a sub, and ring that little notification bell so that you never miss an upload.
Later, y'all.